So we're going to go through some theory, some book theory, on how to validate data. Um, because all of you in this class have been through um, a JavaScript class. Well, I say all, but maybe not all. Um, in the JavaScript world, we did server-side validation with Joy. If you remember Joy, we learned that you validate data on the server because you can't really trust validation on the client pure JavaScript, uh, front-end JavaScript. Why? Because, well, front-end code can be intercepted, manipulated, and basically you can get around it. So you can, you can send some JavaScript validation to the client and savvy developers such as yourselves can say, hey, if I change this JavaScript to do it this way, on my client, because it's front-end code, then I can actually trick my browser into sending the data that shouldn't be sent to the server. So you can't really just trust front-end validation. You also need validation at the server level. So that's a lot of what we're gonna explore here is server validation. Of course, we've done server-side validation um, with some attributes on our properties. And so remember we decorate our properties with required attributes and things like that. And so that's kind of where this starts. But then we also um, bring in some client-side validation so these two things can work in tandem and that's how they should work, right? You should have, I mean, in a perfect world, you're gonna have validation in three places. JavaScript in the front end, middle tier, AKA your application tier, your C sharp tier, and at the database tier, right? So, so you would have a database table that only accepts integers between this range, right? So you have constraints on your database tables. So that's database validation, then you've got your C sharp validation, and you've got, that's really secure, right? To only have validation in one of those places is not the best practice. Having, having that in all three places is the best. And so um, out of the box, you know, we're, you can kind of see here a movie class that doesn't have anything. Yeah, question. You know, I thought to myself, <coughs> let me get this going on Discord. And I never did. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry about that. Um, what you know, I come across this slide and it, it immediately I go, ah. What, what, what are we looking at here? You know, it's like, why, why am I looking at this? And, it, it, okay, it took me a second, but I remembered. So that's good. Even when you don't have these attributes on your models, you do get a little bit of validation for free um, in that your views are gonna be strongly typed in many cases. And so we're just doing this simple like movie model and here's a view that is strongly typed that accepts a movie. And so your controllers um, are going to send a movie into this view, right? So think of the controller that sends a movie into the view for display. Um, and really the, the validation that you get for free is basically if the data can't be converted into a movie object, then validation is going to fail, right? So there is a little bit of validation out of the box for free. Um, of course you use these ASP4 attributes so that it's movie.name, movie.rating, so on and so forth. And, um, that's 
that's for free. And so if we kind of look here, um, you know, what, what is this doing? Well, you're going to post a movie um, and here, Here is a <clears throat> controller that's going to take a movie object and send it to the view. And ultimately, if this data, if this movie can't be converted into this movie object, you get uh, you do get some validation for free. So notice here, if you type in four, well, that string cannot be converted into a rating that is an integer. Right, so even though we don't have anything decorated here with attributes, um, you do get some validation for free. Of course, <clears throat> probably the most beneficial uh, thing to cover is what are the data attributes for validation? So as we've done, we've used some of these um, and others we have not. So <clears throat> a required field obviously is going to have the required attribute. <clears throat> There's two versions of the range. You know, like uh, if you've got an integer, we'll say a, a minimum of one and a maximum of 1,000, so, so that's fine. If you have a range for a data type, and so, for example, one of the hardest things to validate that that I've heard before, but the more I'm doing it, I, I'm like living it now. And if you guys think back to JavaScript, probably the hardest thing we had to validate in JavaScript was like a date object to say, oh, give me all the dates that are three days in the future or four days in the past or between this range. And so when you have this range constructor that accepts a type, you know, you can do things like, hey, instead of just a range of like one through 100, that's acceptable value, let's accept a range of dates. And you can compare a minimum date and a maximum date to see if it's a valid date. Of course, we're gonna work a lot with dates uh, in this chapter. Um, and this is just one approach and so to draw your attention, um, well, well, we'll get to that. We'll get to the, the date time using the range. Um, back to this required, one thing that we did without a lot of explanation, okay? And, and now is a good time to review why we were doing what we were doing all along. Page 407, if you're looking at the required attribute, it says makes sure the property value is not null or an empty string or white space. Okay, and then the thing that jumped out to me is that numer numeric data types like int should be nullable. Right, so we were doing that quite often on our models. We were making our ints nullable but if you want to use a required attribute, um, that's why, because required checks for, for null, right? So to me, that offers an explanation as to why we've been doing what we've been doing. And just to kind of pull up, this is like chapter four, the movie crud app that we did. Um, so you can see here when I have like a required year that that our integer type is nullable, right? Now, could I follow what the book suggested and just kind of mimic that? Yeah, but I think that that kind of um, offers a little bit more explanation. Um, With the range, you know, I kind of said like, oh, one through 100. Um, you can kind of see in here, it says, in order to use the range, the type must implement I comparable. 
boy, if you remembered I comparable from a C sharp class, I would be impressed. Um, yeah, it was an interface that we we did literally one or two labs with the I comparable interface, but you know you did it once and you moved on. Um, Basically what it says though, most C-sharp types like integers, doubles, decimals, strings, and date time implement the interface. And so if you're gonna put a type in that range, like date time, that type has to implement iComparable is what that says. Um, and so that's just a note on the range. Um, back to here. <clears throat> um, I'm thinking of passwords, and passwords often have a length requirement. Now, this length is, you know, a maximum length, which if you know anything about password security, the longer the password, the more secure it is. Like, um, just an interesting note. Most of us think, I'm going to make a secure password. I'm going to make my A's a letter at symbol and I'm going to make my S the dollar sign. That does not make your password nearly as secure as having a long password. Make your passwords 15 characters long. So why would you, you know, in that, why would you limit the upper limit of a string if your passwords are more secure? Um, I don't know, maybe let's say, you know, more less likely that a user remembers it. I, I don't know, but, but you can say, hey, this input field only has two characters, like you want an abbreviation for a state. State abbreviation, you could set string length of two, and there you go. Yeah, Vinny? Um, does that string length attribute cover both the minimum and the maximum, or just, just the maximum? Just the maximum, yeah. Seem very no, no, I, well, again, there, there could be cases, but, but you're right. Now, one thing that is really useful, and it just keeps coming back up, regular expressions. Um, Full transparency, uh, regular expressions, has never has never been something I've considered myself particularly strong with. Um, I've studied them, I've learned them, and then I don't use them for six months and I forget. And then I come back to them, and I remember the rules. But uh, thankfully, there are websites, and, and and I know I've visited this website with you guys before regex 101 that will help you build a regular expression so um, depending on your language you first kind of select your language like .NET C sharp common tasks and certainly there are regular expressions out there um, <clears throat> that uh, that you could implement and so any regular expression, and keep in mind, regular expressions are completely customizable. Whatever you want your data to be, capital letters, lowercase, special characters, no special characters, you know, parentheses, no parentheses, brackets, whatever it may be. You know, Josh mentioned to me the other day, he, it is a internship, he was, you know, the user could type a phone number and they would like insert parentheses and things like that. And, you know, all of this can, can be solved. You know, and it would let you go over the phone number length, which is bingo. the case for that string length. Bingo, yeah. Mm -hmm. So so you can only put in nine characters, whatever it may be. I feel like a lot of times with those... Ten characters? Ten characters. Three, three, four, right? Yeah, with those phone numbers specifically, it almost seems like nowadays they just take whatever you type in and like convert it to the parentheses. That's so what I'm just, talking about. Yeah, yeah. that's what it does. So if you just type in like an all, you know, no spaces, all numbers... It'll one 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 one. Yeah. Going to convert it to like parentheses. Super nice, right? Yeah. Because that's the format that that obviously you're expecting. The user can type in whatever format they want. It's just going to put it in the format that you want. Yeah. Right. So that's super nice. So you know, definitely. Okay. Required fields. We got required range. Basically, any data type that we use can go into a range. Right. There is a little caveat there. Is that there, your data types here? have to implement I comparable. All the C-sharp types do for the most part. Um, string length is a max string length. Regular expression is completely customizable data. A compare. Now, of course, if you're doing a registration form, you're going to compare passwords, right? One field to another. 
how to compare one password to a to a second password field. You mean like repeat your password? So yeah, make sure they're the same. Make sure they're equal. Um, and then finally is the display. Yeah, great question. So it's right uh, in the book on page 409. Um, if you can see page 409, you've got some properties there on a customer class up at the top. And you can see a password and confirm password. See those two kind of at the top? You could just see compared to the confirm password, that's going to make sure they match. Okay. That's, that's kind of what I thought. Yeah. Can you mix and match? Like, what if you, instead of comparing on the password, you compare on the confirm to the password? Yeah, you can do it the other way around. Okay. Yeah, that's totally fine. Now, um, the last thing here is display. Now, a lot of times in... In the database, you're going to have a first name property, but probably if you're going to give an error that says, please enter your first name, you want it to say, you know, first name, space name. However you want it to display to the user, it's probably going to be different than the property name, right? So, so that's what the display property is, is being used for. So that instead of saying the property name to the end user, like D-O-B, date of birth, you can spell it out, date of birth. Date of birth is required, not D-O-B is required, right? So uh, the display property here, uh, I should say the, the display attribute is used for more friendly error messages. Um, I do think there are cases, I do think there are cases where the business is going to say they want some, you know, they want their data into the database in a very specific format and there may be some cases, you know, where you need to use other server side validation besides this. I mean, that's a lot of what the, that's coming around the corner. I'm just going to make something up here. I'm going to guess 98% of cases you could get by with these. I'm just making that up. So there's a lot more to this chapter. But I think for especially what we need to do for learning this, I think in most cases we can get by with these attributes for validation. Now, Again, this is just a server side, so something else I'm interested in exploring is server side in combination with client side, because I, I, I do want to explore that a little bit with you guys. Uh, hi, Ben. Oh. Oh, cool. Okay, so we've done this. This is nothing new. You need a using data analytics data annotations here and uh, our strings are too long or the rating is not within a given range. We've done all of that before. And again, default validation messages are given. Um, again, if you want to change name to be a display name, you can change that display property. So instead of saying the field first name is required, it would put a space kind of thing. Um, you have any? What I don't get about that is when you're creating the error message, aren't you making it customized anyway? So like Same. if you don't do it on a custom error message, you get one by default. That's right. You, this is the default message. Gotcha. Bingo. 
And so if you want to change that default error message, there you go, required with an error message. We've done that before. Um, so this is now, it'll say, please enter a name instead of the field first name without a space is required. Um, so definitely a nice thing to do. Custom error messages, been there, done that. And to Amel's question, how do we, how do we use that uh, compare attribute um, here we're comparing the password field with the confirmed password field down below um, Okay, and notice here what's interesting, again, we've, we've done this a bunch of times, but it's, we're gonna learn some other techniques here. Your, this div has your validation summary of all. There, there's another value that we're, we're gonna learn that you can put there, so that's, we know what that does. This will make, uh, this div will make an unordered list, right, and uh, bullet items of, all your validation error messages. The other option, and we haven't done that other option, is if you want to display an individual error message, you put that in a span next to the control itself. Have we not done this? Yeah, you've done that. Um, recently or a while ago? It was at the beginning. It was at the beginning. That's right. That's right. Um, Okay, so this is that validation summary of all. Okay, this is, so again, a little bit of review of what we've done. Maybe some nuances of like why things were done this way, but, but nothing terribly new. I think this is a very useful chart that does have a couple new things in it. Um, but this I found interesting because what do we write? Well, we write, we write these input tags as if this is what's being sent down to the client. But you gotta realize what's actually being sent to the client, you know, basically the server is going to process this tag and translate that into actual HTML, right? In actual HTML, there is no ASP4 username. And that's, that's not a, an attribute of the input tag. And so this is a server-side server -side control, you know, I've heard them called, right? This is a server-side control that's gonna get processed by the server and sent down to, to the client. And so what the client gets is something like this, right? Where you have an input type of, well, whatever it is, text box or date time, whatever it is, and you get these data val attributes. Now we didn't study data val attributes in HTML, um, and frankly, I've seen them used more in, in line with scripts. And so you know your, your script can read your HTML and select things based on your HTML, right? So that's what these data val attributes are going to work with. These data val attributes that get sent down um, can work uh, in conjunction with some client-side scripting. Okay, so we'll, we'll kind of take a look at, well, for example, jQuery, right? jQuery is a JavaScript library 
that can do validation. Right? So someone wrote a bunch of JavaScript, saved it in a JavaScript file, and they called it jQuery. Right? And then jQuery does a bunch of neat things. We didn't study jQuery because we did some other, we did React instead. Um, then someone wrote a bunch of jQuery. So someone wrote a bunch of JavaScript, saved it in a JavaScript file called a jQuery. Then someone wrote a bunch of jQuery, saved it in a JavaScript file, and they called it a jQuery plugin that does validation. So there, there are libraries of, of jQuery, of JavaScript. There's a library called jQuery. And there's a plugin there that does validation, which uses these attributes that are rendered by your, by your server-side code. Right, your server-side code sends this HTML down to be used with a client-side library like a jQuery validator. And I thought maybe instead of just like highlighting this, um, oh, so this is, this is that HTML without an error, but then notice if you go to post, and there's an error, it adds this class of input validation error, right? Again, your client side code can render uh, the styling of your controls, put a little red air, you know, uh, box, a little red uh, border around your input field um, to show that there's an error there. Um, so let's, let's just kind of glance. Again, I think this is interesting just to look at this, the client side code. And here's again what we did in chapter four. And just to inspect a text box, um, you could see that there's the class of input validation error. That probably wasn't there. Do you see, you can squint, you can see the input validation is there. Uh, there's your data val, data val required, please enter a name. Well, what do you think goes up in the, in the error message? Please enter a name. Vinny? Uh, I'm not quite understanding. Is that input validation error always there, or is that only showing up whenever like, they don't input a name? Yeah, it's only showing up when they don't put a name. So if I kind of go back home and I go to add new movie, yeah, and I inspect now, name now, Submit. Yeah, it's not know. there, right? So yeah, because that's confusing because I sh just showed it to you like it was always there. But mm -hmm. but I, I tried to do a post. And the point is that class isn't there on the, on the get, mm -hmm. right? So there was an action method that was a get for this add method. There's a get add, right? And it doesn't send it out. Now, if I click on save, what's it do? It tries to go to the post. And the post says, ah, I got a validation that model state isn't valid. Model state isn't valid. Go back to the page. And now, you know, render these controls differently, right? It, it adds these classes. Um, Want to point out one more thing here? You can always tell if it's client-side validation or server-side validation based on the refresh. So if I go here, watch my tab, if I click on save, that hit the server, right? We saw the refresh, right? That's not client-side validation. This is server-side validation. So you know that save button hit a server, that server responded, and we refreshed the page. <clears throat> Because if it was client side, it wouldn't have even uh, gone to the server. It wouldn't have gone to the server. It just would have hit the JavaScript file on the client. And that's kind of what I want to dabble into a little bit is get some client side uh, code going. So I am going to jump ahead just a couple of slides because there's um, well actually I don't want to jump ahead of this slide I'm 
notice here when the the div that has the validation summary in it. So this is my div with my validation summary of all. And you'll notice that the li has a display none, right? So this div is hidden when the page loads. And again, just because we're, we're looking here, let's just look for it. So let's go to add movie, let's inspect, see if we can't find that div. So there's my container, there's a main tag, don't think it's in the header, there it is. There's my div, it's clearly hidden, right? Now the class of text danger, so that's a bootstrap class, validation summary valid. And somewhere in here, I bet you if I look through the CSS, no, it's just really there's an unordered list, and there's the li style display none. Right? So somewhere in there it's just being hidden in with the CSS. But it is there. <clears throat> Um, and then once you post it, right, and it's going to go from validation summary of valid, and then once it comes back, it's going to go to validation summary of errors, which is no longer going to hide your list. And if you, if you actually look at your site.css, and we can do that, you can see some classes. Um, to have a border, I guess that's red, it says same red as text danger. So it's going to have a red border on our, I don't know where the red border is, I don't see a red border. Input validation <laughs> error. Right I don't doubt that the class is there. So there's the class, validation summary errors. Yeah, but I think it's on the input tag, wasn't it? Input um, input validation error, that is correct. Now, the class of form control. Uh, You know, as, as Sam was pointing out yesterday, sometimes in battling CSS uh, importance, if you will, rules of specificity, you know, I don't doubt that that border is being applied as a, a red at some point. Maybe something's overriding it. Because um, here's a, let's see, border one pixel solid CE D4A. That is the class that's being applied there. And my border color somewhere else might be overridden. Um, but the point is there's some default styling for these classes that are being added and subtracted to these, to these controls. See that? So you can see, like Josh was saying, the red border is on the input control. But then when I do it, the red border is not on the input control. It's probably... Uh, precedence uh, of uh, rules of specificity on my CSS. How specific is one border being applied compared to the other? Yeah, do you remember the uh, rule? Oh, man, here's, here's a um, there's a Remember this one? Yeah. I always, I always thought this was a little, I always got a little chuckle out of this. Uh, so Ryan says, hey, isn't there like a, a way to write a CSS rule that overwrites other rules? And, and you got the nuke down here of the, the, the exclamation point important. 
that's supposed to, it doesn't matter what, it's supposed to override uh, everything else. Well, you know what? Bootstrap, the developers of Bootstrap, also know knew that there was a nuke option, and they they actually sprinkle the important in their styling. So, are we even using that style sheet? And that's the other question: Are we even using that style sheet? So this was coming from site.css. So let's maybe I'm not even using that, right? So I guess looking over here. You could tell it's Bootstrap CSS. Bootstrap CSS. Actually, that's a great point. It might not even be linked here. This is just Bootstrap CSS. Let me look at my CSS. Here's my site CSS. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't even write that CSS. So you could write your custom CSS. Let's see, and let's link to it. So we'll write this custom CSS. And we'll use the old copy pasta trick. That's what I figured it was too. It wasn't even in there. And now let's also make sure um, that our layout is linking to styles.css. It does look like it's linking to styles CSS. No, site.css. Site there, yeah, there it is. There's site. Okay, so now, now let's take a look. Now that we just add, okay, there you go. So whichever ones have that input error on it, then it'll show that. that that's that's cool. Yeah. Uh, I just I just assumed that that was already there. I thought those style rules were already there, and I was wrong. It would seem like that would be something that's baked in. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm glad. This is, this is why we this is why we step through this. Um, so, hmm, what we've done so far with validation is considered. Property level validation. Property level validation makes sense based on where we're writing our validation logic. I mean, we're writing it on the properties of our models, right? Again, the name for this, property level validation. And I think if you were to get into regular expressions, you have a lot of control. Um, writing the the validation logic it, again. Regular expressions are extremely powerful. Um, there's another way to write validation. It's not property level, um, but instead you would write it in a controller. And what's what's the deal when you write it in a controller? Well, you can write C sharp. To do your validation, not just not just have these properties that do the validation as we just went through, but you can write C sharp to do basically completely custom validation in C sharp, right? So, in addition to in addition to the property validation, again, I'm just making a percentage up, totally making this up. 98% you could probably get by with these property level validations. Um, but you can also write custom C sharp to do your validation, um, which they call model level validation. Now you would think that model level dot validation would be in the model. No, the property level validation is in the model, right? Model level validation is in um, the the controller and so if you guys would page 413 and I'll pull up the slide that is in conjunction with this what have we done with validation in the controller so far 
Well, if you look at page 413, kind of towards the bottom, it says, if model state is valid. Everyone with me? Page 413, if model state is valid. Actually, here it is right here. This is really the only logic that we've written in the controller that basically says, hey, there's, there's this thing called model state. And there's a property on that that's Boolean, true or false. <clears throat> um, using that same model state, notice this highlighted, this highlighted code. Using that same model state, um, we write a little bit of C sharp. And based on the model state dot, here's a new method, add model error. Well, we can actually write something like if the customer's date of birth, this is obviously C sharp, right? We're writing our own C sharp validation logic in the controller. If the customer's date of birth is greater than today, AKA if it's in the future, you weren't born in the future. So we're going to say date of birth must not be in the future. And I think, again, just thinking back to a lab, I remember one particular lab where we had some requirements like, hey, all the tickets that were opened from like today, 30 days ago, you know, you can be given some requirements from the business that is more than just, ah, here's a range from like, from like 1990 or, or 1900, 1900 on the low end to 2100 on the high end. Like you, you might have some more business requirements that are like, no, we want to just make sure that it's within the last 10 days or in the next 10 days or, you know, I worked at a video rental store. Like, you know, what are the, the, the video rentals that are 10 days overdue? That kind of stuff. That, you know, we wrote those queries against the database with uh, the mflix when we were learning Mongo. You know, we were writing those kinds of queries. So it's not always like, I would, I would say that, yeah, most cases you can get by with what we've learned, but there might be some, some other cases. And that's, that's, really, that's really what you gotta do here. Um, you know, this just allows you to use this model state object and introduce an error message so that not only does it have to pass, they can work in conjunction, by the way, the property uh, level validation can work together with your model level validation. Yeah. So you said they, they, they work in conjunction with each other, but what if, what if it's the same property you're trying to validate? Would it, so you're saying that it's a range between 1 and 10. Right. And then what if you're also trying to do that with the model? So the way it works, and the book does cover that, the answer to that question, is you, you might wind up with multiple like passes of validation to go through, right? And so imagine you hit your validation, you get like your, your first error set of messages to fix. You fix those errors, you click submit, you think you fix the errors and you get another set of errors, right? So it's not the most like user-friendly thing. Like that can be a little annoying, that's a, but that's basically the answer. Like it would pass one set of validation first, it would check that box, and then it would go to the next set of validation to make sure that that works. So it wouldn't just break, it would just yeah, error just twice. error twice. Yep. Um,
So that's that. Now, remember I said the validation summary um, tag can have other values besides all, if I kind of click back here. Um, getting back, getting back, come on. Right, ASP validation summary of all. Um, by default, you, you get both, right? You get both model and property validation, but you can change that so that you're just working with one or the other. Uh, if you just wanted to do model level, um, you could display those error messages by changing the validation summary to model only. Right, so here, it, well, shoot, there it is. Just needed to go one more slide. Um, username, I'm sure it's not user aim, username. Um, So this particular would show the model. It says, notice it's part of a view that displays both model level and property level messages. So the model errors go up here and the uh, property level messages would be shown in your spans, right? So you're gonna get property level validation errors here where your model validation summary would be up there. It would work together. Okay, so definitely some new things here in that again, like high level summary, we can write custom C sharp in our controllers to do custom validation. I also think it's neat that, you know, we, di we dived a little bit deeper into these different property uh, validation tags. I think those are really useful. Um, when we come back, we're going to look a little bit closer at some of this client side validation stuff and get both server side and client side working together because that's how it should be, right? So that's where we're going to look at jQuery libraries when we come back from a little break. So I um, wanted to circle back just a little bit. And, you know, we uh, were looking, we were inspecting the code that was sent to the to the client, it was data hyphen val hyphen something. And so I've seen these data attributes before, but I just, not super common, so I thought I'd kind of review them. And it's data hyphen and then whatever you want, right? That's what the star means. It's a wild card, it means whatever you want. So the data hyphen star attribute is used to store data private to the page or application. The data hyphen star attribute gives us the ability to embed custom attributes on all HTML elements. So you can put basically on all HTML elements, you could put data hyphen attribute and they can be custom, right? Whatever you want after the data hyphen. So then what we're using here is data hyphen val. And data hyphen val is kind of specific to C sharp and .NET. That's not to say that other, um, well, or maybe it's more of a jQuery thing. I'm sorry, it's more of a, but I, I, this top link says aspcore.net, and then this talks about jQuery. So to me, it's the two things together, right? But the data hyphen val hyphen required, data hyphen val, you know, there's all these options. But I just kind of wanted to circle back and talk about this to understand that you could put these attributes on any HTML element, and specifically, they're used in MVC, 
for client side validation. Um, and so that's what we're about to start talking about is client side validation. Now, we haven't really done a whole lot with jQuery. Um, and we really, I don't think we have to write much custom jQuery at all to do this. Um, but you do get some jQuery libraries for free. And so if I kind of expand wwroot and I go into JavaScript, uh, excuse me, lib, <coughs> there you can see I've got jQuery, jQuery validation and this jQuery validation unobtrusive. And so there's my link to my jQuery file there's my validate.js, and there's one called validate unobtrusive. I could do some digging, and I'm kind of curious why there's one validation and one that's unobtrusive. Unobtrusive just sounds like the one that you want, but it turns out you need all three. You need jQuery, you need the validation, validate.js, and the one that says unobtrusive, I can only assume that unobtrusive builds on top of validate. <clears throat> and so in order to enable this, we need to link to all three of these. And that'll get us going with client-side validation. So if I pull up the layout, up at the top we've got our CSS link tags. And down at the bottom we've got our script tags. Now here's our link to jQuery. Um, we need to link to the two other validation libraries of which they're not linked yet, right? So let's go ahead and pull in our script tag. So there's, we already got jQuery, so we need jQuery validation. There's our dist and validate.min.js like you would link to any other script tag and then let's do the unobtrusive and let's do the minimized one Okay, so we, we're now linking, you don't, it does download the script for free, or if not, you know how to download them using the package manager console. Um, but it doesn't link to them, it's kind of out, out of the box. So all I had to do is link to them. And now I've got client side validation kind of up and running. Um, Remember we talked about property level validation and model level validation. This only works with property level validation. Again, property level validation you're going to be fine with most of the time, so that's fine. Um, it also, as I mentioned earlier, kind of works in two passes. It's going to do client side validation first and then server side validation. So some end users might find that annoying. They fix one set of validation error messages and then there's you know if it doesn't pass the server validation messages that could be annoying right i could see that um but you know at the end of the day this is considered optional but a good practice right the good practice is to do both client side and server side validation so let's kind of boot this up and see if it is in fact working let me close Now again, if we click save, notice it didn't do a post. Did you see it? That's ex excuse me. It's exciting. It's not exciting. Client side. It's client side. It's working, right? Client side validation is working, and uh, the unobtrusive. It's not waiting for. 
kind of like what we were saying earlier, it's not waiting for you to click the save button. It's getting a per keystroke It looks like on change, right? So if I type in the year 19, is there an E in 19? No. Nineteen? Yeah, there is. 19. Come on, spelling. Doesn't matter. 1998. And action. Now, of course, you would like to see them disappear there too, but it's kind of what we're getting out of the box. Cool, so client-side validation works with property level validation moving on. So that's, that's, that's nice, it's simple, it's built in. Literally all you had to do was link to it. Um, and it uses that data hyphen val hyphen all of those all of those attributes on the input, data val, data val required, so on and so forth. Next up. Oh, one last bullet here. Um, it doesn't work well for um, all of the properties, like for example, a range of dates. Range of dates, unfortunately, it doesn't work out of the box very well with. Okay, when I got to this part, okay, and, and this part being page 418, I'm not gonna lie, I spent like 15 minutes on page 418. Cause I'm try it, it took me a while to understand even what is going on. What is 418 telling me? And you know, I could read what it says and that we're creating, you know, custom server side validation and creating a custom data attribute. Well, keep in mind what an, what an attribute is. An attribute are, is the name of these things that we put on the properties, right? So if I kind of go back to my model, this is, this is an attribute, right? That's the name of what goes in the bracket, is the required attribute. And they say you decorate the property with this attribute. And so when it says creating a custom attribute, I, it just didn't click for me for a while. I spent 15 minutes on this page trying to understand exactly what, what it's creating here. Well, we're creating a custom attribute for these properties. Like you can make your own as to say, um, jump back to where I was, whatever slide I was on. If I jump ahead, I jump ahead. Here, finally, it finally clicked. All I had to see was this. I understand that. That is an attribute called pass date that we don't get for free. That's not something out of the box, right? You had to create that. Um, and again, yeah, Ryan. Correct, that is not what we're doing on slide 23. Slide 23 is um, model level validation. And so it's just writing some of your own custom C sharp, but <coughs> it doesn't create an attribute by doing this. 
it is doing like your own custom validation, but this would be like doing your own validation and saving it into an attribute so that you can decorate a property with it, right? In this case, this is just on this is just on a method inside of your controller. Okay, but you can't you, you're not creating a so I see what you're saying. They're kind of similar in that you're just writing your own C sharp to validate some data. But on this one, slide 23, it doesn't save it to an attribute that you can decorate a property with. Does that answer your question? Um, and so, so then once I finally understood this, I was like, oh, okay. Well, then how do you do it? How do you make that? Well, it's actually not super complex, but there's a couple things. And if I, if I keep it at a high level, you're gonna write a class. Notice the class is called pass date attribute. Okay, and you're gonna inherit from a parent. Okay, so you're gonna write a class. There's a convention here, obviously like so many things here, pass date attribute the word attribute is optional but it's a convention to do it so you don't have to but but it makes sense when you inherit from this parent that parent is going to force you to override this is valid method so when you do this little inheritance thing like often is the case it's going to say hey Red squiggly, make sure you override this method. In order to inherit from this parent, you have to override this method. If you look at this is valid method, here's your C-sharp logic that compares, okay, hey, look at the input to this is valid method. You're gonna take in a value and you're gonna see if that value is a date and time and compare, so, so if, if it is a date and time, then let's convert it to a date time called date to check. So we convert value to this date to check object. And we say if date to check is less than today, then we return success. Otherwise, give them an error. Okay, not to get caught in the weeds here because you could always reference this code later. Big picture, how do you create an attribute? Inherit, create a class, name it an attribute, inherit from this parent. It's gonna force you to override a method. The method is gonna have some sort of input to the, some sort of parameter. You don't know the data type. In this case, we can now decorate our property with this custom attribute called past date. And it says DOB must be a valid past date. That's coming from right here. The display name of the second parameter is DOB. The display name of our property is coming in under this validation context variable. So so what is this message? It says, "Hey, is there an error message from the parent? If not, display this and return a validation result object that contains a string message. That's your error message." If you want the error message to be custom, of course, like all the other attributes, it can do that. And boy, yeah. Um, if anything, if you were just paying attention, you avoided some of the pain that I I navigated going through that because that was annoying to understand even what is what is going on and the, the, the part that I found because I'm like studying all these classes and like context class and result class I'm going what are we doing right 
and just kind of jumping ahead and understanding, oh yeah, I know what an attribute is. Oh yeah, you know, it's a custom attribute. Okay, how do you do it? Okay, that's not so hard. Follow that as a reference. You need to like import it into, or I guess it's a public class, but but since you're using it as an attribute like that, like I wonder if there's any special. Like I'm talking about where you implement it. In right the on the. Like if there's anything up top that you need to add in. On the on the model, maybe. Uh, on the model, yeah. On the, model. the model you're using. <coughs> well, you're so good question. So the the thing mm -hmm. of. The reason why I don't think so, and it's a good question though, is because you're ultimately you're making a class. Typically, you're putting the class in the models folder, mm -hmm. and so you're gonna it, it's gonna say using models, yeah. oh, whatever. Okay. And then the validation attribute probably makes it so that that works the way the other ones work. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. You're, they're all inheriting from the same parent. All the other attributes that exist. I'm just saying, like, if I made a class and I didn't have the validation attribute, like, it wasn't inheriting from that, oh, and I just tried to put it in a bracket, like, above, you know, one of my model properties, it probably wouldn't act the same as if you did it. Bingo. This way. You absolutely have to, like, this hard requirement, you have to inherit from that parent. I guess if it's something that you're going to be doing a lot, and you like to make an attribute, if not, it's something like, like 23, whatever, would be fine. Would be fine. Yeah, slide 23, just doing it once in the... In the controller. Yeah, I got a question. Yeah. Uh, it's more on the logic side, but you know, normally when you're checking for like date of birth, like websites, specifically social media, will want to check if you're above the age of 18. Yeah. So could you have like a second class that you know this one's checking if the date of birth is before today, but if you had a second one that checked, like, if they're older than 13, would those two clash, or would they work in conjunction with each other? So let's, let's talk about this a little bit more. So what we're doing here is we're checking if a date is less than a certain value. Yeah. Going all the way back to this, this is really nothing that you couldn't do with the built-in stuff. Yeah. Going back to this, Remember, you can check a range of date time. So what you're saying is mm -hmm. maybe having a min and a max, I think. Yeah, like a, a min of what, 2000? Um, 14 ago? years ago. Yeah. So, so yeah, you can absolutely compare against 14 years ago. And so at first it would check, okay, is the date is in the past, and then once it passes that validation, then it checks the range to see if it's in yeah. that age range. Yeah, you could definitely, definitely do that, and yeah, the the number of applications. I mean, you mentioned social media. You got to be fourteen. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know that they ever work well. They got to be twenty one to buy beer. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So Vinny, this, this actually might be um, exactly what you're talking about. So notice, like, because you're talking about min and max, right? Mm -hmm. So date of birth is one value, right? That you're comparing a past date, singular. Mm -hmm. This next one is accepting multiple values one could be in the past and one could be in the future. So your, like your ranges, if you will, right? If you wanna make your own range, cause that's what I think you're talking about, not using the built-in one, which was what I was talking about. You wanna make your own range. How can you do that? Well, again, this is kind of, kind of the same process. We have a class 
and we inherit from a parent. But now notice that our constructor of our class will take in a value. And also notice there's a property that calls is passed. So we can actually write a custom attribute that allows you to decorate those properties with values. And so if I, again, I think it always helps to kind of jump ahead. Here's a custom property that takes in two values, not just one, but this takes in two. 100 would be sent into the constructor and then is passed would be set, that's the property, right? And that's how, well, okay, we're gonna set this number of years equal to 100. And then we can use this num years variable in our C sharp, um, like something like here. Okay, so backing up a little bit, right? Making our own attributes. This class didn't even have a constructor, right? This class only takes one input, uh, or actually no inputs, no inputs. You think of, of how we wrote this, excuse me, not one input. Look, you call this attribute, there's no inputs into this, right? So what we're kind of looking at that's different here is we're writing a custom attribute here called years from now. And it takes in this value of 100 and this attribute of is passed. Now, what does the logic do? Like if you actually break down this class, Here we have years from now, so 100 years uh, in the future. And it makes sure also that it's not in the past. So I think years from now would accept any dates into the future up to 100 years. It's gonna start from today, right? So starting today through the next 100 years, um, those are the acceptable values. And so years from now, we're allowed 100 years from now. And then we set is passed to true. Now you're going to notice is passed is a, a property that's set to false by default. And so again, it's kind of the same is valid method. And then we write our logic. Um, to basically compare the value that's passed in to see if it's a, a valid or not. So you can kind of see here a couple different ways to return a success. So here's where we're returning success, here's where we're returning success. Otherwise, here's, here's your error message. Okay, kind of not, don't need to beat up on that, but we can write custom attributes that don't take inputs or custom attributes that take inputs like, like a, a, a range of numbers kind of thing. And again, the first value is gonna be sent into the constructor. After that, you can use properties to send in values to do validation. Um, it's also like, hey, this years from now only worked with this property and um, this past date worked with this property. But what if you want to write custom attributes that work with multiple properties? Well, then your logic has to be a little bit more complex. And so you can kind of get into that. Again, they get in pretty much into the weeds and all the different ways to do validation here. So it, is, it does get, you know, the logic gets a little technical. I don't think I want to get caught in the weeds. I'd rather keep it a little bit higher level just on an introduction. You can always reference the code as needed. Um, but let's take a look at this, right? Required contact info, right? So the name of our attribute is called required contact info. And
Well, they don't. Let me see. Okay, so yeah, you can actually tell what's going on here by looking at the code. So notice we're bringing in some data called V and a context called C. Context gives you information about the data that's passed in. So we'll take in C and cast it into a customer and then with that we have a cust object and we could see if the phone number is null or empty or the email address is null or empty. And if it is, we give an error message, otherwise we say success. So this is one attribute that checks for one or more property in a class, right? The property being phone number and email address. jumping ahead to slide 40 a lot a lot to do with these custom validation classes right so here uh, I mean okay yeah I just had to readjust my where I'm at in the chapter um, we're on page 423 when we kind of left off here um, and this is again, we're, we're still working with these custom attributes. And so uh, this custom attribute is, is called required contact info. And what it does is it checks multiple properties inside of this customer class to make sure they're not null or empty. Um, another way, instead of making a an attribute um, is that you can put some of that validation logic in the class and so not in the controller which we were talking about not that long ago uh, putting validation logic in the class so notice this is not creating uh, an attribute now this is just in our model this is our model called customer and we're inheriting from a different class. This is I validatable object. Of course, that's going to make you write this method. And um, it, it works very similar to making your own attribute. Like this method, um, a lot of the logic is going to be very similar. You're checking against is null or empty, the phone number or email address. Um, but now that logic is stored within the customer class and in a lot of ways I just feel like we're learning like three di three or four different ways of doing the same kind of thing um, so you're just kind of given some options here. When, to go deeper into the weeds, when you make your own custom attributes, that's server-side validation. You may want to also, as we demonstrated doing server-side validation that was doing the post back, Right? And then I demonstrated, hey, by linking up jQuery, you can do client-side validation too. Right? Now you make these custom attributes, they do server-side validation. You may also want to validate that on the client as well. Right? So you're writing custom validation, uh, these attributes, but you, you need to get them enabled on the client side as well. So notice this past date attribute, that was the first attribute that we looked at. It inherits from validation attribute and implements I client model validator. So this enables that custom data, you know, that you're validating in whatever way you determine is fit, 
to validate it on both the server and the client. And so this logic here that we're looking at right here, this was all stuff that we did for server side validation. What's new is this method that adds some data val attributes. And again, these are completely customizable. These data val attributes um, to your client side validation. And so the HTML that would be sent down to the browser would have these new data val pass date and data val pass date num years, right? That would enable this custom validation that we're doing to be rendered on client side as well. Um, there's a little bit more to that because you know what what you're doing is you're adding a method actually to the jQuery library they, they actually let you do that they let you extend the jQuery library so there's a little bit of logic to to do that um, and so you kind of put this JavaScript file in here uh, you call this add method you give it a name and then you link to that past date JavaScript file after linking to all your, your jQuery files. So it's interesting. Again, I don't know that we're gonna spend much time doing this. I'm sure there's gonna be some code demonstrations we, we walk through and do it. Um, so that's why I'm not spending a whole lot of time on it right now. Um, you know, but I just don't know. You know, In the real world, how often would you find yourself doing that? I just don't know. Seems like that would be like your job. It, it could be that, yeah, that intensive. Yeah. Now, to kind of bring it back in a little bit, I did find this very interesting. And this is kind of the end of the power, well, it, yeah, this is the end of the theory before we get into the code demonstration. I found this interesting, this remote attribute. We're not talking custom attributes anymore. This is an attribute called remote. And I found this interesting because, this is on page 428, if you guys wanna jump ahead. First paragraph that says how to work with remote validation. So what is remote validation? It's, it's the idea that client and server um, work together. And when you do a round trip, the client does a round trip to the server, you see the page refresh, most cases. But there's actually a technology where client and server can interact without the page refreshing, right? And, and that technology You've, you've heard of it before, whether you recognize what it does or not, is, is Ajax, right? If you've heard of Ajax, Ajax is a way for the client to kind of send a request to the server and get some data back from the server and not do a full page refresh, right? And, and so Ajax, any, like, for example, Gmail, you're sitting there on your Gmail and like all of a sudden the page updates with your new, your new mail. Like you didn't have to refresh it. You didn't see a page refresh. There's some JavaScript going on for that client and server to interact back and forth. Well, that's what remote validation does. It's, it's a way of basically using Ajax, or maybe it's a similar technology, for the client and server to interact, for the, the client to get data from the server and say, yeah, this is valid or no, it's not, right? So the, the book example that's given, and I think it's actually a good one, is the client kind of hits the server and says, hey, does this email address exist in the database, right? So the client's gonna send some information to the server. It's not gonna do a full like round trip where you see the page refreshing. It's gonna be able to hit the database the database is gonna respond with some information and you're not gonna see a full page refresh. 
right? So I found that really interesting. Again, kind of going back here. Um, in addition to enabling custom attributes, which we just went through all of that, so validation runs on the client, you can write code on the server that's called by the client without reloading the page. This is called remote validation, and you can use it when you need to perform a task on the server like accessing a database. So I thought that was pretty cool. How do you get this to work? Well, we're gonna call this remote attribute. And you're gonna notice it takes, well, two or three inputs. The first is the action method. The second is the controller. So you would need a validation controller and inside of that you would need a check email action. You go then to that action method and you write your logic. Now this, this is where all the magic happens, right? That line right there, db.checkemail, it's got to hit some logic to actually query a database that's hidden behind this db class. Right, this db class is going to have some, some logic in it that's going to select you know, all of your database email addresses and see if there's a match. Okay, so there's, there's a little bit of black box here. You don't really know what, what's in the black box, what's the logic in the black box, but you just, you got to assume, you know, we will write it. And for right now, this is a Boolean that just, just says true or false. This check email returns true or false. You can say if there's an email, you can return some JSON. Notice this, uh, this is a requirement. It has to return a JSON result, right? So not an action result, not a I uh, action method, uh, uh, I action result interface, but it's re returning JSON result email address already uh, registered. Otherwise, um, we return true, and then um, if, assuming if it returns true, that you can go ahead and register that email address. Um, so this is, this is a new one. Probably one of the more interesting things in the chapter to me is to enable that like client and server communication without a full page refresh. Um, and so there's a little bit more to it. Obviously you're not seeing everything here, um, but that's the basic theory there. And here you could see if you need more than just one field like uh, if you need a username field and a region, you want to see if a username exists in a particular region. In other words, your where clause would be more complex on the database. You need multiple fields of data. Um, you can add that. So again, this remote attribute calls this action inside of this controller, but it also wants to send over a user, uh, the, the region as well from the view. So you got the username and the region. Here's our check email that takes a username and a region as well. So before it was just taking the email. Notice the input is the email. Now it's taking an email, a username, and a region. Um, the last thing that I that I caught that's important here. Um, the parameter called email has to match the property called email, right? Because this is what's being sent in to this parameter. So this property name right here, email, needs to match the parameter name right there, email. That's how you get the first parameter. It comes in from the property. Okay. All of that gets us to the code demonstration part. And uh, I'm going to stop at least the theory side and I'll break the video up into two parts. 
um, second part being being the code portion. 